So I've been wanting to start writing about video games and tons of other stuff which has interested me in a while now, and what's more fitting than starting it off with the very first game which I have memories of. Growing up I did not have any consoles, but we had a PC at home and boy, did I spend time on it. So my gaming career started on an old ass computer from very early 2000s while I was like 3 years old. The earliest games I remember playing it uh, are those games like Prince of Persia and Dangerous Dave, some random flash games, Just Your Rabbit, and Krog, which I still adore and probably will get to write about at some point. But the game that had the most impact on me was Sonic the Hedgehog. Since I did not own a Genesis, I got to play Sonic on a random CD that my dad regularly brought home for me. It was an emulator CD with a compilation of ROMs which have looked like this. From the tens or maybe hundreds of games in there, what caught my eye was the games of our bloat blue blur. After my initial exposition to the Hedgehog, I continued playing his games over the time and even now I am a firm follower of the series. While I will continue talking about the games of the Hedgehog continuing with the second installment and going forward from there, this is about the very first debut of the Blue Hero. Even though I have played this game many times, I have never looked at it with a relatively critical eye. In fact, I do not really remember finishing it when I was little. By the way, I use relatively as I do not mean this video to be a fully professional review. Instead, it's more like an excuse for me to play the game and give my opinions about it. Therefore, I do not feel like implementing a point system as it can uh, cause unwanted conflicts. For example, I can give this game a 7 out of 10 and rate some other random as game an 8. Then the fans of this game could haunt me for the rest of my life as I would imply one game being objectively better than the other, while I would not wish to make such juxtaposition. Though to be honest, I feel like I will have to experiment a lot with my content as I am still trying to find my footing around here. You will think that me being an English literature major, writing stuff should not be so hard for me but sadly I am a lazy fuck so yeah, hell it took me years to finally even try to be productive. Apologies in, adva in advance for possible bad pronunciations, wrong choice of words and bad essay structure and I am not native to an English spoken country and by no means I am a pretentious writer or analyzer. So the version I played is the one in the Sonic Mega Collection for the GameCube. Now I know to be completely accurate one should play the Genesis version but sadly I do not own a Genesis so I had to try the alternatives which wasn't that hard since there are 100 ports of Sonic 1. Some were obviously a no-go like the Taxman version since it's built up from the ground and the GBA port is it's just a hot garbage. I like to play games on the consoles so I tried a bunch of ports and decided the GameCube version of the Mega Collection was fine enough to review the game on. I tried the emulators too but I think they have more glitches than this version, for example this happens on the emulator while it looks fine in the Mega Collection version. One thing that has consistently bothered me in all the versions was the audio emulation. Some sound effects just sound weird and the background rhythm of the Green Hill Zone completely gets murdered. A shame too since I like to listen to that melody the most. Other than that, I played through everything old school with my CRT setup and D-pad and of course without save states. To be honest though, I wish there was save states because I originally started the game on the emulator but around the labyrinth zone I had something to do and had to stop playing. Unfortunately though, my save decided not to work for some reason, so I had to start all over. I knew the Mega Drive version had save states so I switched to that in case of a similar situation happening again. 
but to my luck, GameCube version of Mega Drive did not allow you to save anyway, so I just finished everything on one sitting. Just like how you had to do it in the old times, that or you kept everything open for a while. Sega! Sonic the Hedgehog starts real strong. In fact, it starts so strong that it still keeps going. The premise is simple. You are a fast blue hedgehog versus some egg guy polluting your island. So you have to chase and stop him from doing so. I do not have to tell you just how iconic Green Hill Zone is, both its visuals and music. In my book, it's also where the game is at its peak because it has a solid level design sense on top of the whole aesthetic. One should realize just how great this looked when it first came out. Its fast, colorful graphics and world design caught the eyes of everyone. The same year Nintendo released Super Mario World for SNES and no doubt Sonic looks flashier when compared. Now do not get me wrong though, I love Super Mario World as well and I think it also looks great. It's just Sonic with its speed looks uh, fresher. And I think this commercial sums up my point pretty well. Gotta go. Hey guy, you're the first serious gamer I've seen all morning. Check this out, brand new 16-bit Super Nintendo with Super Mario World. Wow! Oh, what's this one? Oh, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog from Sega Genesis. Hey, look at these radical colors, huh? Wow, Sonic's fast too. No, over here. I like Genesis, and it costs a lot less. We kid, that game. I'll take Sonic and Genesis. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog, more action, more speed. Sega Genesis, it's a whole lot more for less. So for starters, this game has 6 stages. Green Hill Zone, Marble Garden Zone, Spring Yard Zone, Labyrinth Zone, Starlight Zone, and finally, Scrap Brain Zone. Each zone is divided into 3 acts where you collect rings and stuff, try to make it to the goalpost and face off with Eggman at the last act. However, if you collect 50 rings by the end of an act, a giant ring appears and when you hop into it, you get to experience LSD for I mean you get into the special stage. In the special stage, your goal is to navigate Sonic to the end of the maze where you collect the Chaos Emerald. There are 6 Chaos Emeralds in the game, therefore there are 6 special stages, and only with collecting them all and taking down the final boss, you get to truly clear the game. If you do not collect them all, this screen shows up instead. Each zone has a share of their gimmicks with Green Hill having a Green Hills, I guess, Marble has Lava and Blocky platforming, Spring Yard has Springs, Labyrinth has underwater traps and all that, you know, water stuff, Starlight has vertical platforming, and Scrap Brain has, like, a literal house. The zone you are in changes the pace of the gameplay significantly. In fact, sometimes you may feel like playing a different game. For example, playthroughs of Green Hill and Labyrinth are vastly different as their design philosophy is quite apart. This pace-breaking aspect of the game is one of the negatives for me, which I will get to. Labyrinth Zone especially feels pace-breaking because apart from the level design, the underwater sections feel really slow, and not solely because of the mechanics but because of the slowdowns occurring when Sonic is in the water. Because I'm not playing in the uh, original Mega Drive version, I'm not really sure how accurate the technical details are but I do remember people mentioning this problem in the original version too, along with another slowdown problems uh, happening when a bunch of strings are spread out, uh, some camera problems and that spike glitch. While I did not find those problems to be game breaking, they certainly are an annoyance and I thought we're worth mentioning. I think the only bug I have encountered in my playthrough was this weird moment in Starlight Zone. The enemies, aka badniks, also change depending on the zones and social your way of approaching them. For instance, those caterpillars appear in the Marble Garden zone and if you approach them the way you have approached the Motobox, you will get hit. Instead, you have to either jump onto their heads or use your spin attack from the front. To this day, I still fear them a fair amount and play like this upon encountering one. Similarly, Bob cannot be destroyed by player at all and instead will blow up on their own. Barabots will try to ambush you from the ground and Orbinaut will throw their projectiles before getting left defenseless. This variety in the enemies adds spice to the gameplay and encourages you to think before attacking instead of mindlessly jumping on every enemy you see. One little cute detail is that depending on the zone you are in, the rescued animals change too so while I was playing in the underwater sections of the labyrinth zone, 
I do about the face of poor animals who I rescued from robots as not all of them would be able to swim and would eventually drown. But apparently in those zones, the rescued animals are always either Pecky the penguin or Rocky the seal. So they won't drown I guess. The way the level is structured, there are three main paths you can follow. A hike, a medium and a low road. If you are skilled enough, you can keep yourself on the top path, find some secrets and avoid whatever the hell is below. If you fall from there, you get to the medium path, where it takes longer to proceed compared to the higher path. And the lower path still takes you to the goal but it's the longest and has the most resistance. Secrets can be found in any way regardless of the path though. You are not simply expected to rush through the stage, but to explore it. The game feels rewarding in that aspect as if you feel like there are secrets somewhere, there usually is. Those secrets can be ring boxes, shields, one-ups and even massive level skips. All levels more or less follow this design philosophy. Then why did I claim that Green Hill was the peak of this game? Well, let us just compare these two footages. As you can see, what puts Green Hill above the other levels is the pace. Most other levels have slow and tedious platforming sections where you cannot do anything but to wait. Lava sections of marble, those absolute unit of blocks and spring yard and labyrinth as a whole. The only other level which does not really have this problem is Starlight Zone. And no wonder why it's my favorite level in the game. Though the music and the level team also help. It feels so rewarding to just chill and go fast in this level after Labyrinth Zone. Now I do not think Labyrinth Zone is that bad but there is no denying that it really is a slow level. The game has a pattern of giving you a slow level after a fast one, like Marble after Green Hill, Labyrinth after Spring Yard and Starlight after Labyrinth. So those slower levels are on purpose. Someone from the developing team probably thought, let's give those guys some time to slow down after they play for a while. Well, let me tell you though, it was a bad idea if you ask me. Now I get it, if all levels were like Greenhill Zone, the game could feel repetitive I guess, but I understand they felt the need to change the pace a bit, but I'm sure there were better ways of doing so, as with how it turned out, their decision kind of breaks the pace rather than changing it. Some other low points of the game include cheap deaths. Some enemies and traps in the game are placed so that you cannot react to them without knowing they were there before. In other words, getting hurt by them once. The bosses of this game are certainly our bosses, I guess. I did not find them much of a challenge and nothing special overall. The only ones which gave me the trouble were the ones at Spring Yard and Labyrinth. Spring Yard because I was tired of waiting for the boss to get lower so I jumped to try to hit the boss and fell to my doom and Labyrinth because the boss was the Labyrinth Zone itself. So even then what gave me the trouble was the game itself and not the Eggman. Also if you die once at the Labyrinth Zone boss, you do not get any rings to collect before the boss, though there is a shield right behind the checkpoint making it harder to reach Eggman. I lost a bunch of lives here for the first time. All other bosses need 8 hits in order to be beaten and it is fairly easy to do so. One exception could be the final boss as you have to face it with 0 rings but I even lost a life at it myself most likely because this guy is a side boss in Sonic Mania and I have beaten it countless times by now. So the final boss is fine but the rest of the bosses feel somewhat underwhelming. But do you know what was definitely not underwhelming? The fucking special stages. They have overwhelmed my every cell with the absolute chaos they possess. Now I mentioned that in those stages, you guys sonic to the end to the chaos emerald, right? So how you do that? Well praying to a god is a good alternative but if you want to take a more solid route, you can jump when there's a solid block under sonic. The D-pad barely does anything to direct Sonic anyway, and as the maze turns and rotates, you try to get to the end.
but it is never explained in the game. Well, it probably was mentioned in the game guide or something, but as a veteran I also have recently discovered those. Even then, most of the time I feel like I have zero control on special stages and watch myself roll all over the place according to the flow. That is why I prefer the hardest sections of the game to the special stages, because at least there I still have some control over the game and stages don't keep rolling forever. I have mentioned a bunch of negative aspects of the game, such as the inconsistent pace, cheap shots, underwhelming bosses and hard to control special stages, so I might seem to have a negative opinion on the game. However, I like this game very much. Even then, one must point out the negatives in order to appreciate and understand the game fully, or else it will be just some biased propaganda. Also, even with its flaws, there are some aspects of the game which easily carries the rest of it, namely the mechanics and the aesthetics. Let us get the easier one out of first. Personally, I like colorful, original, unorthodox, stylish looking stuff and I feel suffocated in environments like in those. Games like, let's say, Gears of War, where the dominant color scheme is grey, uh, has a lower chance of getting me to play itself. So this game gets my point on that account. The game centers a man vs nature team and your progression shows the effects of Eggman's control over your island. The bad next you destroy turns into animals which will powering the machines and in the good ending of the game you restore the island's nature even more. Each level has its distinct personality provided to them by their respective level teams, colorful environments, set pieces and music. I think one detail that sells the look of a stage is the layered backgrounds. The way the mountains at the back of the green hill moves really gives you the feeling of progression. Each stage has its own fitting music, and the soundtrack of the game is really solid too, but you probably knew that already. It is pretty much given that the Sonic soundtrack is out to be good, except a handful of exceptions. Well, this is the game which started that legacy, and for good reason. They really got the sound department right for this game. A lot of things work in harmony to produce the quality of the soundtrack. The composer of this game, Masato Nakamura, is a member of the G-pop band Dreams Come True, Hence the pop feel of the soundtrack. The guy is a bassist and a damn good one too. As a bass player myself, I really appreciate the work he has done for the game. Honestly, what carries this soundtrack for me the most are the bass lines of Nakamura and the drums of Genesis. Just listen to some of these tunes, preferably with a headphone and try to focus on anything other than the main melody. I personally, like I said before, love the background rhythm of this song which goes like All tracks fit their respective environment and match the game emphasis on speed. For Green Hill, each track gives this fast-paced, cheerful organic tune. In Marble Zone, you do get the feel that you are exploring an underground ruin. Spring Yard has even more of a pop, funky feel. Starlight Zone makes you feel triumphal and is more relaxing, fitting the night scenery. And Scrap Brain is outward sinister. I think a track that suits the least to its zone is the Labyrinth Zone. It has that vacuum feeling for sure, but I don't know if I would have guessed that it belonged to an underwater maze if I heard this track for the first time.
Nevertheless, it is a good track and gets the job done. Still, I think the drowning music suits the labyrinth zone better. The sound team did a fantastical job with this one using the new opportunities of the Genesis and its sound chip. For more information on Sonic Music, Moving on to mechanics, one aspect I claim to be the carrying the game, funnily enough, is as simple as it can get. All buttons make Sonic jump, and the D-pad moves Sonic in the direction you desire. The most complicated move you can perform is spin attack, and is achieved by holding down when Sonic is running. The brilliance is in the variety of stuff you can perform with this simple moveset, which can only be achieved with smart platforming, right usage of momentum and knowing the zone you are in. In fact, the zone themselves with their loops and slopes can be considered as game's mechanics because those combined with sonic momentum can lead you to higher paths, to secrets and shortcuts. If you know what you are doing, you can speed through any level real fast and with real flow. Let me demonstrate what I mean with actual footage. Compared to Mario's more linear design levels, Sonic levels are more like a roller coaster ride and designed so that if you master the game, you can ride them with ease. It is no secret that Sonic was created to rival Mario, and Yuji Naka's inspiration comes from the speedrunning Mario's first level. Here's the quote from Yuji Naka himself. Back then, games didn't allow you to save your progress. So when you wanted to play Super Mario Bros, you always had to start from World 1-1. You could use the warp zones to skip many of the other levels, but you always had to play through the world 1-1. Doing so eventually became kind of tedious, so I always tried to get through the level as fast as I could, and that inspired the initial concept for Sonic the Hedgehog. Remember what I said in the beginning of the video? About the differences of old games and now? This is what I was mainly referring to. It goes without saying that games of now lets to say with ease. Starting from Sonic 3, Sonic games also have that luxury. But here, you do not have that. If you lose all of your lives, you start at Green Hill, no matter if you died at Marble Zone or at the final boss. You could say at those times, every game was a Souls-like. This is where the concept of continues comes into play. If you have collected 15 rings inside the special stage, you are awarded with a continue. So when you lose all of your lives, you can start from the same level instead of playing the game all over again. And I assure you, without continues, Unless you play the game a dozen of times, you won't be able to finish the game that easy. And finishing the game doesn't simply mean beating the final boss. You also need to collect the 6 Chaos Emerald from the special stages. And to get into the special stages, you have to bring 50 rings to the end of the level, which is not all that easy as there are lots of hazards and enemies waiting to ambush you. So you should carefully plan your way and make quick decisions on which path you need to take. 100 rings alongside with the 1-up boxes gives you an extra life, so you need to search for those as a safety net. To do so, you will need to explore the level and take different routes. All those factors combined involves you into the game and its stages, making finding secrets and progressing through the zones all the more rewarding. This is what I think makes the game fun and what I think is its strong point. The explorable levels and general design philosophy also supports this, with its branching up and low paths, lots of hidden goodies and secret pathways. This is how the game was meant to be played. To someone from 2020s, this concept may seem weird and distant, after all, what game uses continues in this time and age? Let's jump to Sonic Generations for example, I think it's a great Sonic game and I hope to get to it eventually, but there is no denying that its difficulty is a joke. You don't need to search for emeralds nor continues, you simply blast your way through the end. Granted there are red rings and some other challenges to keep you entertained for a while, but those are all just extras. You can finish the game without any of those unless you want to 100% the game. 
Now that is how I enjoyed Sonic Generations and even Sonic Forces by doing everything possible in the games from getting all the collectibles to A or S ranking every stage to completing all the achievements. I did all those to get a sense of challenge and completion from the game. Now if you ask me, I should not be doing all that stuff to get it and instead the main game should provide it. Even then, not all people finish those games to 100%, most people I imagine just beats the final boss, maybe do some challenges here and there and considers the game done. If a player with this mindset were to play Sonic 1, they most likely will try to rush their way through point A to point B, missing out all the details making the game better, and losing the purpose of the game. I know this because most of the time that is how I played the game too, but only after giving it the chance and try to understand what the game stood for I was able to appreciate the game and my playthrough felt 100 times more rewarding than some other random one. This is what I meant by the clashing of old versus the new, giving this game a mixed reception nowadays. Now, by no means this is a perfect game, far from it. It has lots of issues and it really can use some improvements. However, it will use improvements as this was only the starting point for the blue blur. Sonic 1 lays a solid concept in front of Sega and as their first attempt at such an unorthodox game, I can overlook some of those flaws. Considering the circumstances of its era, with all those flaws, Sonic 1 was considered as a phenomenal game and boy, do I need to prove that. Simply the existence of this essay and the existence of the Blue Blurs himself alone should be enough to prove the impact of this game.